My name is Susie Marlowe, and I'll be talking to you about conservation detection dogs. You may know this, but dogs can do so many different jobs. There are bomb sniffing dogs, medical assistance dogs, even coronavirus detection dogs. I bet you know of a few that I didn't even list. But today, we're going to focus on learning more about the company I helped create called Rogue Detection Teams, who trains conservation detection dogs for science. We will be talking about what kinds of dogs we look for as co-woofers, which I think you may find surprising. And we'll also talk about the secrets and how we teach our dogs to sniff and sleuth for science. And we'll talk about a few studies that we've done. But first, I wonder if you know more than I did when I was your age. I only learned about this certain animal when I was in college. When I was assigned to this project a few years ago, I had to do a bunch of research to make sure I knew as much as possible before Skye, my dog, and I went to Vietnam and Nepal. In the first three seconds of this video, if you know what animal this is, go ahead and say it out loud. Check out our journey. traveling for that job, but it was really stressful. So who am I? I'm Susie and I'm a detection dog handler. We call ourselves bounders because we're bound, we bound through wild spaces with our dogs, which we are bonded to. I want to tell you that I knew I wanted to work with animals when I busted out of the fifth grade, but I didn't know how or what that looked like. I ended up studying biology at Penn State and then I worked at the Grand Canyon National Park. I worked with endangered sea turtles, and I even scuba dived and researched coral disease. But I soon discovered that this, that this job existed, and I knew that it was the job for me. And when I'm not working, I love doing anything outside. Now here's Skye, who I hope you'll meet in, who you briefly met in this video, and hopefully you'll meet her during our question and answer session. Sky was rescued by the Santa Fe Humane Society, who noticed she had a very special talent, and that talent was being absolutely obsessed with playing fetch. I picked her up from an airport and brought her back to a training facility. She was very shy and didn't trust people much at all. She's been my primary sidekick for the past five years and knows about 20 different targets. We have traveled all over the U.S. and, as you saw, even overseas. I've learned so much from this little ball of joy who has really emerged from her shell, like how she really doesn't like my dancing and garage doors, or how she loves to crawl into sleeping bags at any temperature during the day. So what does the term conservation detection dog even mean? Well, imagine them as little detectives in the wild, but they can't do it on their own, so it takes a special detective human sidekick to make this work. Sky and I are a detection team that offers researchers a way to sniff out answers. If a biologist wants to learn about cougar populations by analyzing their scat, I can teach Sky to find cougar scat over a large landscape. If a scientist needs to learn about salamanders, 
I can teach Skye to sniff out salamanders, even hidden in logs. If tree growers need to learn if a tree is diseased, I can help teach Skye to alert to a sick tree. So when you heard me say Skye can investigate over 20 different targets, it can mean so many different things. So we survey different environments for a specific target that will help researchers answer their scientific questions. It sounds so simple and wonderful, right? Well, there's a lot behind using dogs in a conservation setting. But first, let me explain a bit more about how we do it. But first, quiz time. Bow, bow, bow. Why do we use dogs? Is it A, because they run far, B, because they have a really powerful nose, or C, because they can find targets even in the snow? If you answered all three of those, any of those three, then you are right. First things first, what makes this method so powerful? Well, why can't we just look for scats ourselves? And why dogs? Well, we ask cats and they aren't as eager to please. So now that you know they can run far, they have a great nose and they can find targets in the snow, we can take a little bit of a look deeper. Dogs are very smart. They're able to remember multiple odors at the same time. So if I want to find cougar and wolf scat at the same time, they get it. They can start to learn that cougars usually mark under trees and wolves will usually mark along roads. So they'll search those features. They're adaptable. As long as, quote, the game is present, the dogs can work on water, in snow, follow a scent up a tree, and even figure out how to alert to invisible targets. They're efficient. Like we mentioned, the dogs can cover large landscapes over a short period of time. Typically, Sky will survey two to three times the distance I do when we work. She does not tire over the game. One time within three hours, Sky found over 200 samples and boy was she happy. Simply put, a dog's heightened sense of smell is an amazing piece of technology. Humans have 5 million olfactory or smell receptors. Dogs have 250 million olfactory receptors. You've heard of dogs detecting the coronavirus, cancer, and even epilepsy. So they can find a smelly target in a complex outdoor environment where humans may only find the obvious ones. The dogs can find the hard ones. So let's play a game. How powerful are dogs' noses? True or false? Write these down on your paper. If one Olympic-sized swimming pool has a teaspoon of sugar in it and another one doesn't, a dog can alert, and alert to the sweetened pool. Two, when a friend is baking cookies, you may say, oh, I love the smell of baking cookies. But a dog would say, ooh, I can smell the ingredients like baking soda, flour, eggs, sugar, and chocolate chips. Three, dogs can even smell pheromones, a special chemical that all of us give off when we are afraid or maybe even in love. They might be able to know who has a crush on who in class. So which one of these is true? Guess what? All of these are true. Dogs' noses are very powerful. But when it comes to a conservation detection dog, it's a little different. I'm going to show you how our dogs work by displaying some of my exceptional Disney animation skills. But before I do, I want to help explain a scenario here and specifically define a scent cone. Ding, ding, ding. What is a scent cone? Can you tell me? Is it A, an imaginary cone of stinky air that begins at the source of an odor. B, is it similar to an ice cream cone? It holds odor and the dogs love to hold it and smell it. Or C, an area where no smell exists. If you put A, you are correct. A scent cone is an imaginary cone-shaped area that begins at the source of the odor. The cone represents the space the scent travels along with the wind. So check this out. Okay, so there are two mountain lions. One's named Bob and the other's name is Linda. They are both elusive mountain lions. When people employ hunting dogs, 
They follow the scent of an animal typically with their nose to the ground and would only track, let's say, Bob. By doing so, hunters spend a large majority of their time following one individual and not focusing on finding a sample from multiple individuals. So our dogs don't track. Generally, scientists want to learn about all the animals that make up a specific population, both Bob and Linda, the purple mountain lion. By using point source detection, we can learn about both Bob and Linda. So here's Skye. She's moving through the environment, and right when Skye smells that stinky sample, she sits and gets a reward. Then the reward is put away and Skye keeps sniffing along. Skye is able to move freely through the environment and find targets that are both from Bob and Linda. When she hits that scent cone, she wants to go back into that stinky smell. So as she works into it, she then gets to sit and she gets her reward. So it's my job as the handler or bounder to identify habitat for mountain lions, which along here is this ridge line that you can see on the topography map. I also need to be aware of possible danger like barbed wire or cars, and I need to observe what the odor is in the environment is doing. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about what makes our dogs want to do this work. Some people start asking, well, what kind of working dogs are you looking for? A black lab that retrieves birds, a Malinois that does police work? How about a German Shepherd? None of the above. Meet our pack. They're all a bunch of misfits and that's how we came up with our name Rogue Detection Teams. They're all a bunch of rogues. Dogs that don't really make it in the pet world. How you ask? You can see all of these dogs look quite a bit different. There's little Beckett here who's slightly larger than a house cat and then there's Ranger who looks like a big bear. Most of these dogs came from a shelter. They weren't able to find a home easily because they were unique. While they, are all, while they all look so different, they all have one important thing in common. Ding, 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 quiz time. Is it because A, they love to eat bugs, B, they love to dress in hula skirts, or C, they love to play fetch? Yep, they love to play fetch. I'm talking loose wire, nutty, must have or I'll die, where is it, where is it kind of drive to play fetch. I'll show you a few examples in a moment, but this drive is apparent in so many different shapes and sizes and breeds of dogs, but this drive can be fairly rare. So most of these dogs came from a shelter. The shelters work so hard to try and find the perfect home for these dogs. But they soon realize, oh, this dog needs a job because if they can't get enough energy out and play fetch, they may be reactive or destructive or considered dangerous. So this unique trait, their intense drive to play fetch, makes them perfect for the work we do. Why, you ask? I'll tell you shortly. So here's an example of Captain's Drive. He is a dog that actually came from an amazing family and they couldn't keep up with him. He's got intense eye contact, he's frothed thin at the mouth, he's got some muscle twitches, and I'll tell you, he plays non-stop. His owner was even training for a mar marathon at the time and took Captain on all of his runs, but it just wasn't enough. So you still may be wondering, like, I don't get it. Why does ball drive, what does ball drive have to do with finding scat or plants? Usually students like to tell me how their dog rolls in poop or maybe eats some grass. So why would a dog want to sniff out a certain species or a target for eight hours a day? Do they get paid well? No, not really. <laughs> Drive can look very different, especially with so many different personalities. But what's important with this job is that the dogs never realize they are working. And here's some of our pack with their drive. Thank <laughs> you.
see at the end, there's even a dog that likes to play with a metal dish. It's pretty crazy. Detection dogs love their job because it is based around our dog's favorite game, which we creatively call the game. But the basic foundation is to emphasize that the target equals the ball. So if we place a scat out, let's pretend it's Bob the mountain lion scat, and we let a dog do what they're born to do. They sniff around it and they check out the new smell. So again, we place the desired target out. Quiz time. Bam, bam, bam. What do you think we do next? Do we A, throw the ball, B, pet them and squeeze their cute little faces, or C, say, ew, gross, get away from that? Yep, that's right, we throw the ball. The moment their nose hovers over the scat, boom, the ball magically appears. We do that over and over and over and over and over until the dogs are like, whoa, check out this magic poop. Every time I sniff it, my ball appears. So now they're eager to find that poop so they can play ball. During a survey day, they may get the ball over 200 times. And guess what? The 200th time is just as good as the first time. We do this work up to 10 hours in a day, month after month, year after for year, year. And for them, it doesn't get old. That's why it's so important that we look for dogs that are obsessed with playing ball. I've known dogs that will stare at a refrigerator for six hours because they know their ball is on top of it. And most people don't look for that behavior in a pet. So once the dogs understand the association between when I find what the human shows me, I get to play ball, then switching out a target order for something different can be very straightforward. Here's another example of training. Here's Zilly. Her name is short for Godzilla. She is going to be trained on a wolverine scat which is totally a real animal and not just a comic book hero so there's the scat sitting there then zilly goes up and gives it a big sniff boom the ball appears party time for zilly then i start to say sit as she smells it she's quick to learn that if she sits then when she finds a scat she tells me hey susie it's party time throw the ball. Then I repeat this over and over and over and over and over and over and well you get it. The dogs really get the game. Eventually the game can look very different. We have different challenges for the dogs which helps them learn different styles of searching and encourages certain traits. This is Pips working the wall and you'll see a couple of other dogs. The first trait we like to emphasize is their independence. So you've heard me say target over and over. Well, what does that mean? Our dogs find targets. Targets can come in all shapes and sizes for conservation work. Some of our work, but not much, involves finding live animals. Some, uh, some work actually involves finding dead animals. Finding a dead animal is an essential clue. Is something wrong in the habitat? Is a man-made object killing that animal? Or is something in that part of the ecosystem simply hunting that animal? Dogs can also find rare plants. Or they can find plants that are invasive and that take over the landscape. Our doggy inspectors can also find invisible things, which can be the trickiest case to crack. It can take a very strong team to be able to solve that mystery. Finally, our number one type of target is to find scat. And we'll talk more about that shortly. But as long as you can communicate the odor to the detection dog, then we're good to go. But always consider communicating that odor can actually be pretty tricky. Dogs don't speak human, and like we mentioned, they're very smart. Among these categories, the targets are so diverse. As mentioned, here are the dead things the dogs have found for science. Birds and bats at wind facilities and wildlife kills made by a certain animal.
The green icons are plants that the dogs can find. And the red icons are diseases that the dogs have sniffed in an actual plant. The blue icons are all the live animals our rogue dogs have found. And the rest of these animals, researchers have been able to study by looking at their scat. That's right, as big as whales and as small as pygmy rabbits. From these diverse targets, you can really see how amazing dogs are for the field of conservation. So now that we've talked a bit about scat, and your initial thoughts might be, poop, ew, why in the world would researchers want to find it? Well, scat can provide an extensive amount of information to a researcher. So before I tell you, I'm going to ask you, quiz time, bam, 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 why scat? As a, you can see what the animal has been eating. B, you can tell if an animal is pregnant. Or C, you can tell what type of animal did it by analyzing its scat. If you chose any of those answers, they are correct. By using GPS locations, we can tell where an animal has been. With observation, we can tell what it has been eating. And with genetic analysis, we can tell the species the individual and the sex of that animal by coding its DNA. With further analysis, we can even tell if an animal is pregnant or stressed by looking at their hormones. Believe it or not, geneticists can run tests to see if toxins are present in the animal's waste too. Analyzing scat is very similar to going to a doctor and having them draw your blood. It provides this wellness exam, but without ever having to see the animal. So the last point I have is that scat collection is non-invasive. But before I tell you what it is, bam, 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 quiz time. What is non-invasive? Is it A, when you politely ask the animal, may I please draw some blood? And they respond, but of course. B, when you need to hold the animal, but you don't take any blood. Or C, you never have to see the animal and it doesn't change the animal's normal behavior. If you answered C, you are correct. All right, scatologists, now that you've learned a little bit about scat, it's time to identify these samples, something I need to do with my job almost every day. Write down the letter to the corresponding number. Number one, number two are the little black dots, and number three. Now it's tricky, you don't have a scale to be able to help you identify, but if you answered one is cougar, two is caterpillar, three is whale, then you are correct. Yes, whale poop can float on the water. Now it's time to learn a little bit about some real life investigations that our rogues have helped with. The mystery. One of the rogues most recent studies brought Sky and me to Yosemite National Park. This study has been ongoing since 2019 and involves multiple survey styles, which includes scat surveys with the dogs, genetic methods, and camera traps. So what animal were we trying to study? And I'll give you some clues. The animal buries its kill so no one can steal it. The animal can jump 18 feet high, and its scientific name is Puma con color. Is it A, a squirrel? B, a mountain lion or cougar, C, a human. If you answered B, you are correct. It is mountain lion. Biologists had no idea how many mountain lions were in the park. Instead of trying to capture and collar the lions, which is dangerous and expensive, they tried to non-invasively study this large carnivore. From camera traps and scat analysis, their goal was to determine the population size and distribution in the park. Well, to collect that much scat over a huge space, we needed to prepare our meals for the next three months, both human and dog. In Yosemite National Park, we needed to reach 10,000 to 12,000 foot saddles. Backpacking with the dogs was essential. We had to prepare first aid kits to treat any kind of altitude sickness and to be able to manage pad injuries over rough terrain. 
We even had help. Porters, or really strong volunteers with backpacks, helped us carry tents, food, and collection supplies. This was our home base for three months, a tent and a few essentials. The dogs were rewarded each time they found a scat, and then we had to collect it while preventing any kind of cross-contamination to preserve DNA. We had to survey into the fall and temperatures got pretty cold for little sky. And always we had to consider whether mountain passes were too snowy to pass or if the park was going to be closed due to fire. During this study, we collected more scat from Fisher, Bobcat, and Red Fox. I told you dogs were smart. But from the three months of this work, 50 scats amplified as cougar. Here's a classic looking cougar scat chalky and as thick as your wrist, a little segmented. And from these scat samples, there were 25 unique IDs, which means there were at least 25 cougar in Yosemite. Rangers and biologists were so surprised. Here's a photo of one of the cougars in the park. Next to it is a map that shows the genetic information from picking up their scat. The squares are male, and the circles are female. These yellow circles up here show that this tra female traveled pretty far over the park. Currently, geneticists are unable to identify the age of the individual in scat samples, and that's where the cameras will shed more light on details of this population. They can tell what's a juvenile and what's an adult. This type of teamwork through using different technology like detection dogs and camera traps will only help create a stronger investigation case for mountain lions in Yosemite. Here's another, another study that will continue this summer in Alaska. Rogue Jack is our main bat dog. He was adopted from Washington, had two harnesses and three collars at the shelter that rescued him. That's because he was an escape artist. His new talents are falling asleep anywhere and finding bat sign. Biologists in Alaska know that bats are important and want to know where do bats sleep. But first, quiz time. Bang, bang, bang. Why are bats important? Bats are cute. A, bats are cute and need protecting to maintain biodiversity. B, bats pollinate flowers. C, if we didn't have bats, farmers would have to spend $22 billion to kill pests. If you answered A, B, or C, you are correct because all of those facts are true. Because bats are so important, humans use camera traps to try and learn as much as possible. They can even use specialized bat spy equipment that allows scientists to hear bat talks, bat talk, but they still don't know where bats sleep. Currently, biologists have to look for bat habitat, place a camera in the area, and hope and pray that that camera will capture that tiny, animal in its field of view. Imagine doing that in a steep forested slope. It's literally like finding a needle in a haystack. Humans were not so great at it. So scientists wanted to see if dogs were better at pinpointing bat roosts in a large landscape in a talus field or in forested area. So Rogue Jack was called in. His nose is another amazing piece of sniffer technology that can help biologists locate bat hibernacula. They hoped that Jack could not only find bat scat, but they wanted to see if he could alert to bat activity. He learned this new game by smelling fur samples and various items that had been rubbed against bats. Thanks to a fly fishing company, they were able to train with bat fur without introducing other odors like plastic. Bat fur was intertwined with thin wire to create the perfect training mechanism for such a lightweight and low odor target. They would then cast this, quote, bat fly into a field of rocks, and Jack's job while training was to find it. Once Jack, Jack figured it out, they took it into the field. The team had traveled, had to travel to some pretty remote locations via helicopter and camped in areas where there were grizzly bears, but because they took the right precautions, wildlife didn't bother them.
The team went to ridges where they knew bats were congregating but couldn't capture them on camera. Jack would indicate where he smelled bat odor and scientists would mark the spot and set up a camera. And guess what? It worked. And there's the field where they had to search. I've also learned a few other things. But before I share these lessons, this is Pips. He was returned to a shelter six times before finding his career as a working dog. You'll have to wait to see him. But patience and repetition in learning is key. I think we all agree that dogs can do amazing things, but don't forget they practice, practice, practice. So that means you should too. Stay curious. Because of the dogs and their curiosity, I have found some amazing things in surrounding wild spaces. Sky even found a live pangolin once, so don't be afraid to explore. One man's trash is another man's treasure. Not only are we collecting poop for science, which animals definitely don't need to keep, but we're also finding dogs that were once deemed unadoptable, and now they're heroes for wildlife conservation. And last, of course, here's Pips. Don't ever feel limited by what people say. If you're described as too much or just not the right fit, do not give up. Like all of these dogs, know that the skill sets and characteristics that you have will be perfect for someone or something. So the last question I have, we all know that the dogs like to go to work so they can play ball. If you could pick one item to work for besides money for the rest of your life, what would it be? Please write it down and give it to your teacher. I'd love to see it. Thank you all for taking interest in the work Sky and I do. It's so fun being able to talk to a classroom full of amazing kids such as yourself. I wish I could be there in person, but I could go on for hours. So keeping it to 30 minutes is a challenge. If you have any, any questions about the work we do, don't hesitate to reach out. Talk to your teacher. We have a number of social media accounts to stay connected to follow our adventures. And if you guys think we need the newest social media platform that is unknown to me, shh, let us know. Maybe you can be part of the Rogue Pack too. Bye.